Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Ivan and, and Colin, for inviting me to speak in your seminar series. It, it is a pleasure to uh, to be here today in, in your department. Uh, I've had uh, uh, some interactions with with your department, not as many as I would like over the years, but uh, uh, I, I know some faculty better than others, and uh, we have also had the pleasure of having some of your faculty speak in our department. Uh, uh, namely, uh, Dr. Bayes has spoken in our own seminar series in agriculture, and I think Dr. Talpan has also um, spoken in our department in various uh, on various occasions. So um, when you invited me for this uh, seminar last fall, I, I was delighted to to accept it uh, because I think uh, um, overall in general we, we have a lot in common, especially in the genetics uh, field, <clears throat> genetics genomics field. Um, I've collaborated with with uh, doctors uh, Shankel. He he has served on uh, on the advisory committee of some of my stu students in the past, and uh, Dr. Talpan and and I have published uh, papers together with another student. So so the connections are already there, and uh, there, I I hope and wish that they they are even more in the future, and. Uh, I, I'm also hopeful that my seminar today, my presentation might might serve to enhance our, our, our already very good collaboration and, and connections between animal biosciences and, and plant agriculture. Uh, so so what uh, of, of the many things that I, I, I considered to, to talk about to you today, um, it wasn't easy to 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 pick one because I've I've been working in in different fields, uh, anywhere from uh, from plant breeding to uh, genomics, plant genomics and and uh, uh, genomic selection, high throughput phenotyping, uh, um, focusing on different traits in in soybean, which is my specialty, and and then uh, after some consideration, I decided to talk about. Uh, a long-term project that has been occurring in my lab, which um, I, I titled the Selection Signatures, uh, Genetic and Phenotypic Diversity of Canadian Soybeans Through Decades of, of Breeding. So, Okay, Dr. Yeah, Rajan, go ahead. sorry to interrupt you. No problem. Uh, I just, uh, I may introduce you first, okay, for oh, people oh, that I are not. I, yeah, they, I, I see. I, I understood okay. you as saying, hey, go ahead and present. Oh, sorry I'm sorry. That. No, <laughs> that's uh, that that's was all uh, right. That's OK. I'll, I'll let you do that, please. Yeah, no problem. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you already heard a few words from our speaker, and so I will introduce him and then I'll pass it over to, to you, Dr. Haichang. Sure. So we are delighted to have with us Dr. Ishvan Raichan is a professor in the Department of Plant Agriculture here at the University of Guelph. So Dr. Aichan received his PhD in canola breeding and genetics from the University of Guelph, and he's been leading a soybean breeding and genetics program here at the University of Guelph since 1998, where he focuses on seed compositional traits for food, nutraceutical and industrial uses. In addition, his research involves exploration of genetic variation for yield and disease resistance traits using exotic germplasm, as well as organic soybean breeding using classical genetic and genomic tools. Dr. Aichan has trained 46 graduate students at master's or PhD level. He is the recipient of several awards, including the 2022 Canadian Plant Breeding and Genetics Award, for his significant contribution to the advancement of Canadian plant agriculture through research in plant breeding and genetics. So Dr. Raichan collaborates widely with Canadian, Chinese, US and European scientists. He has co-edited two books, published 10 book chapters and more than 100 peer reviewed journal articles and developed more than 70 soybean cultivars. So with that, with that I'll pass it over to you. Thank you Thank so you. much. 
You're very welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Ivan, for, for that kind introduction. Uh, so once again, it's a pleasure to be here uh, in your seminar sem series in your department today. Uh, the, the topic of my talk today will, will uh, span uh, several years or all, close to a decade of, of uh, research in my program. And I, I titled this the selection signatures, uh, genetic infinitypic diversity of Canadian soybeans through decades of, of uh, breeding. Um, I, as I already mentioned, uh, th there have been some collaborations and connections between our two departments because uh, we, we share a lot of tools, we share a lot of software uh, and met methodology uh, as geneticists and genomicists between plants and animals. The, the, uh, the two types of organisms are very different. Uh, there are certain things that we can do in plants that you, you cannot, for example, uh, it, it's very common for us to, to self a plant and produce a progeny that can segregate and become uh, homozygous after generations. That's not really uh, possible in animals. So, so many things are, are similar. Some things are different, but uh, uh, I, I find and I'm, I'm actually grateful for um, animal scientists, uh, animal geneticists for developing many tools for genetic and genomic analysis and bioinformatics that we we have borrowed and, and then ad adapted to to plants you you often led the way in in that uh, so uh, I'll, I'll be talking about my, the, the main topic of my research over the years uh, and that's soybean soybean is the world's uh, largest protein and oil seed crop um, and it has a 2n number of chromosomes 40. it's a self-pollinated plant uh, which uh, self-pollinates about 99 percent of the time with with very little uh, uh, no more than one percent uh, cross pollination uh, so why is it grown it's grown for its seed uh, because the seed is is rich in nutritional compounds uh, on average for 40 percent of of the seed volume is protein about 20 percent of, of the seed is oil it's used both as a source of edible oil and as a source of protein once the oil is extracted so um, extracted from the seed or crushed from the seed what's left over is is um, is uh, the the meal that is processed to animal feed so so there's there's uh, at least uh, the first connection between soybean and animal science we uh, a lot of uh, uh, feed uh, so uh, animal feed is made from soybeans because of its uh, rich uh, uh, protein compos composition soybean uh, originated and was domesticated in china uh, many about 6000 years ago from the progenitor glycine soja and uh, which had the same number of chromosomes but uh, looked very different, uh, more like a weedy, prostrate, viney plant, uh, as opposed to soybean, which is a, a, a larger, a robust plant with much bigger seeds. Uh, that's the result of domestication efforts by the Chinese farmers. It uh, wasn't introduced to North America until 1765, when a farmer in Georgia brought soybeans to to um, to his farm and grew it uh, uh, as as a as a forage crop rather than uh, for seed, uh, so so the introduction of soybeans to to North America came first, and then uh, soybeans were only later introduced to South America, Central America, and Europe. Although Europe was Adjacent to Asia, uh, it, uh, soybeans actually made it to Europe later than uh, they made it to North America. <clears throat> so uh, again, uh, focusing on the seed composition, uh, why is soybean so valuable for for, uh, for the seed composition? Because uh, th this source uh, stated that uh, about approximately 40% of the volume of soybean seed is made up of protein, and that's high quality protein with all uh, essential amino acids present. Uh, about 19 to 20% is oil, about 35% uh, are different carbohydrates, sucrose, saccharose, raffinose, uh, uh, starch, and about 3.5 percent are are minor components of, of so the oil is one of the highest quality vegetable or plant oils because of its fatty acid composition and a low um, level of uh, saturated fat and high level of uh, unsaturated fat uh, so uh, switching to soybeans in canada so in canada soybean is the th third largest field crop uh, 
in 2018, the farm cash receipts, uh, receipts um, uh, sur uh, surpassed $3 billion. And uh, soybean has been increasing in, in, uh, uh, in its production in Canada, in acreage and, and yield over the past 10 years, especially, uh, which has led to an increase in production. Um, historically, Ontario has been uh, the, the largest producer of soybean in Canada, uh, followed by Quebec. But about five years ago, uh, five or six years ago, um, Manitoba surpassed Quebec because there there was enough uh, available short season soybean cultivars that could grow there uh, to 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 increase the production in Manitoba, make it the second largest province for soybean production. Uh, a lot of soybeans are exported to to foreign markets, uh, especially to Japan, uh, China, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, and other countries. Uh, uh, if they are exported for oil, they can be exported as either oil from a source for from GM or genetically modified or conventional soybean. If uh, they are exported as food grade soybean to be processed into various food items such as tofu, soy milk, um, uh, uh, or soy soy drink, uh, miso, uh, natto, and other products, uh, then uh, they have to be non-GM. So, so non-GM soybean is is a requirement for food grade soybeans. Uh, GM soybean can be grown for as a source of edible oil. <laughs> So switching to soybeans at Guelph and the contribution that the University of Guelph has made to, to soybean uh, introduction and expansion in Canada. Uh, first of all, most of you are, are familiar with um, or have heard the name uh, Charles of Zavitz Hall because it is right here on campus um, and close to the Brandian Plaza. So Zavitz Hall was named after the professor um, uh, uh, Charles Zavitz who who started working in the Ontario Agricultural College in the 19th century and uh, was truly a pioneer and a very innovative uh, um, professor and, and, and farmer who has brought and, and developed uh, different cultiv different uh, species for, for adapted them for growing in Canada through his work. So he's uh, credited to, to bringing soybeans to Canada in 1893. Uh, he, he went on a trip to Kansas. He picked some uh, varieties there of soybeans, brought them uh, to the extreme southwest of Ontario, Essex, Lampton counties, where it was the warmest. It is the warmest in Ontario and started growing them and the earliest materials that could make it uh, mind you, Kansas is uh, significantly further south, so so any late maturing varieties would not make it in southern Ontario, but the earliest varieties he kept selecting. He wasn't doing breeding in the sense of making crosses, but he was selecting among uh, plant populations, to, which led to the development of the first Canadian soybean variety called OAC 211, which was uh, released, uh, developed and released by the, uh, by the Ontario Agriculture College as a forage soybean. Uh, uh, today, soybeans have come a long way. They've been grown since the Second World War as a source of, 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 of oil, edible oil, and uh, more recently as a source of biodiesel and also as food grade uh, uh, soybeans. So in uh, two th 2017, it was actually the year, uh, the record year for Canadian production at more than 3 million hectares grown across the country. Uh, and that was the first year when the um, on Ontario's pr pr proportion of soybean production fell under 50%. It has gone up again and, and uh, Ontario is still the largest producer in Canada. In 2021, last year, Canada grew um, two million, over 2 million hectares or more than 5 million acres of soybeans. Most of it is in um, Ontario, uh, Manitoba and Quebec, a little bit in Saskatchewan and in the Maritimes, uh, the re remainder in the Maritimes, uh, PEI especially. Uh, so as far as the Canadian, as far as the Guelph soybean breeding program, uh, our primary focus is the development of conventional, uh, which means non-GM soybean varieties for the food grade identity preserved market. Uh, why do we do that and why do we not develop genetically modified um, 
glyphosate tolerant or, or Roundup ready. So it means uh, mainly because many of the multinational seed companies are, are involved in that market and, and it's, it's difficult to compete with them once we, they develop a new trait um, and uh, they make it the source of the trait available to public breeders. Uh, by the time we develop new varieties with that trait, uh, they're they come up with a new trait. So it's it's been difficult to compete with them. However, they're 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 not very much interested in the food grade market, and that's that's uh, our role as a public uh, breeding program to develop and deliver and make available soybean varieties that are food grade non-GM for Ontario and, and other farmers. Uh, so so it may be interesting to know that uh, about approximately 25% of about three, 3 million acres of soybeans grown in Ontario every year is a non-GM or food grade. So that's a significant market for, for Guelph soybeans. Uh, there are also other public breeding programs at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, which I will mention later uh, at Harrow and um, and Ottawa, uh, but uh, the majority of that, the, those acres uh, of those 25% are planted to uh, varieties from Dr. Milad Eskandari's program, uh, who is another soybean breeder at Guelph at Rich, located at Richtown campus, developing the later maturity group soybeans and, and my own program uh, that focuses on maturity groups uh, zero, uh, uh, double zero and one. Uh, so how do we do a breeding program? I, in the interest of time, I, I won't go into the details of, uh, of, uh, of the methodology, how we develop soybean varieties, uh, but uh, that can be av made available to anyone who, who asks. Uh, so just uh, in, 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 um, in a few words, we make approximately 230 cross combinations between Milad and my program. Um, every year. What that means is uh, each of us uh, picks about 30 parents and then uh, we, we make uh, a, a limited number of uh, parent parental co combinations based on, on the goals of, of each for each cross. Um, so every year and that the crossing is all done indoors in the growth rooms in the crop science building here and then we we grow those soybeans to to f2 in the field and f2 seed is sent to costa rica for for two generation advance over winter so we get uh, the following year we get f4 seeds back uh, that are 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 more homozygous and better to to uh, make selections on uh, so so on approximately 5000 f4 plants from about 30,000 are, are selected on a single plant basis, both by Milad and myself uh, or, or his and our program. And that uh, results uh, uh, about eight years later um, because uh, we have cut two years from, from the development period due to uh, using a winter nursery in Costa Rica. It, it results in three to five uh, cultivars being released uh, every year uh, to the indus seed industry. Uh, you you may notice that throughout my talk I will be uh, using uh, the terms cultivars and varieties interchangeably. They they mean the same thing. So this is uh, the map of uh, Southern Ontario. It may also explain to you why we have uh, two soybean breeders at the University of Guelph. It's a, it's a very large area. Um, let me just get my laser pointer. Okay, so it's a very large area. So, uh, you, here's the Guelph campus where we are all located uh, right now. And there is the Richtown campus about two hours drive southwest of, uh, of Guelph. Um, uh, the, uh, there, beside our two public breeding programs at the University of Guelph, there's also two other public breeding programs at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Ottawa, uh, one and Agriculture AFC at Harrow as well. So one f very far in, in Eastern Ontario, the other one is in the extreme south. Um, actually, where Harrow is located, it's it's south of Detroit. It's, it's even more to the south than Detroit. Uh, so so uh, the reason soybeans actually have 13 maturity groups from double uh, from triple zero to group 10. Uh, when I visited Brazil in the area, Paraná state, uh, they were growing mostly maturity groups uh, six. 
uh, and 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 seven, and depending on the region in Brazil. So so that those soybeans would never make it here uh, because they need a much longer season and more heat. Uh, what we can grow in Ontario, and that's quite quite a lot of maturity groups for for a relatively small region from double zero to group three. Uh, those are the maturity groups we grow. So my mandate for soybean cultivar development is uh, from double zero to group one. And then uh, around London, uh, Milad takes over and, and develops varieties for, for the years uh, for southwestern Ontario uh, that are later maturing. So in, in soybean breeding, uh, most of our crosses are, are made uh, by crossing two parents uh, rather than three way cross or double cross that uh, that's rarely done in soybean. And uh, why is it that way? Because it, it seems to work for us uh, just fine. So, so we we pick parents based on their merit, uh, and uh, we we combine them to to make sure that the progeny will will inherit the traits, the best traits, uh, hopefully from from either parent. So. Uh, when we make the crosses and those crosses are made uh, indoors, uh, then we produce the F1. The F1 is uh, then uh, planted here and taken to Richtown for transplanting into a, um, an irrigated nursery to grow a large F1 plants, which will give us a, a lot of F2 seeds. Uh, again, I mentioned before that F2 seeds go in October to Costa Rica, come back in April to to Canada uh, as F4, two generations later in, in as little as six months, and then the F4 seeds are planted in, in the nursery, and we make single plant selections to keeping some of them and, and uh, 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 rejecting or dropping others. Uh, so from that point on, we, we go through the rest of the generations of, of selfing, uh, se selecting a, on a single row basis, then to uh, four row plots, uh, unreplicated and replicated, uh, then uh, grown at several locations and then more locations until by the time we have uh, about F8 or F9, we already know which which will which uh, uh, lines will be winners and uh, can be commercialized as, as new cultivars or varieties. So traditionally, uh, it, it's it's been a uh, it's been a, a, a a tradition for soybean breeders to cross elite by elite parents, so best with the best. Uh, but that for for anyone who, anyone who is a geneticist, uh, uh, you you may realize that there is always a concern among breeders uh, about plateauing of of uh, yield increases if yield is the trait you're after. Uh, so if you keep crossing elite by elite, uh, you may end up crossing similar with similar, and and uh, once the uh, genetic variation for any trait is depleted, um, you may not get any any further progress. So so we haven't seen that. A plateauing yet, but there is a concern that it could happen. So, so for that reason, and also development of of new uh, uh, races of pathogens, we we sometimes have to go and and get a parent that's a trade donor for for resistance to a disease or a race of a disease that wasn't prevalent before in in, in your target region, and then uh, we cross uh, the elite parents with those donors that often are not agronomically uh, very well performing, but they they have have a very important gene we would want to incorporate and then we often back cross that trait into elite background um, and so uh, sometimes we go and, and use exotic germplasm because we are interested in incorporating uh, introgressing new alleles for traits of interest whether it's seed composition trait compositional traits resistance or high high yield so so I'll be talking more about that in 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 the rest of my talk so as far as how how the diversity goes uh, from the, the exotic germplasm is uh, typically poorly adapted uh, and the, the elite parents are are always high, highly adapted to the region or target region of selection and breeding and uh, the um, diversity goes uh, the, in the opposite direction with the least diversity in the elite parents and most diversity in exotic germplasm. So uh, as it happens, uh, uh, in in any breeding program, whether it's plants or animals, uh, we we uh, we uh, make selections and we make crosses, and 
there's a, there is a, a the, the breeder's equation where the heritability and selection differential or selection intensity will will drive the selection in in the um, uh, desired direction so what's shown here is if there is a bell shaped distribution of a plant population and you select the the, the best uh, material let's say from this triangle and intercross that in the following you're going to get um, uh, a response to selection in the way that uh, the mean for the population, the population mean will be uh, shifted to the right uh, if, if the right is the direction you want to go. Let's say that's a higher yield, seed yield for, for, uh, for a plant. So uh, how can this be uh, uh, managed? Uh, one way is to increase the selection intensity that could uh, shift the, the mean a, a little bit further than otherwise. And another one is to increase the heritability of traits you, you are working with. Uh, so so this uh, leads me to uh, the concept of population bottleneck. Uh, so we are we're concerned uh, that from the time when the glycine soja was a wild plant uh, uh, that was discovered by by Chinese farmers and then uh, they, they made selections and started uh, uh, selecting the best looking plants that led to the domestication of soybean as we know it. Um, so so the uh, it, when uh, this in this study by Heisen et al, uh, they looked at uh, the num a percentage of loci that were fixed in the wild soybean progenitor versus the land races, which were not truly developed through breeding, but farmer selection. Um, and then to North American ancestors that became the basis for for all of North American uh, soybeans. Uh, you can see here from looking at the stars, there's fewer and fewer stars and fewer colors uh, that remain because uh, the uh, selection has led to a, a fixation of many alleles in, in the progeny. So uh, the good news, though, is that from uh, there was a a significant increase in low side that were fixed from the the wild progenitor to land races, but then uh, uh, furthermore from land races to North American ancestors, there was a, a additional uh, increase in the fix, fixation of alleles. But there hasn't been too much of a uh, of a uh, further increase of fixation from North American ancestors to elite cultivars that are grown today. So we haven't been losing as much variation as, as had been uh, uh, hypothesized uh, would be the case. Uh, so, so what are the is issues in soybean breeding? Uh, the diversity of elite by elite crosses, which most breeding programs do all, all the time. Uh, we in the public sector are probably uh, known to to uh, dabble or, or, or explore more unusual crosses than our colleagues in the private sector who uh, who work for seed companies uh, that are profit driven and if they don't develop a new cultivar uh, you know those breeders may lose their jobs in our case we could uh, we could experiment more and, and do a little bit different things that could benefit both our programs and their programs. So so the question is, is there enough diversity in, in the current uh, Canadian soybean germplasm for future breeding efforts so we don't reach a plateau and, and instead we continue to uh, enjoy the gains from selection? Uh, another uh, question is, how do we identify and test new germ germplasm to be used in the breeding program? Um, is it through molecular markers and, and uh, identification of genomic regions or, or otherwise? Uh, because field testing is expensive, uh, making selections of, of the most promising material is, is uh, economically uh, feasible and, and efficient way of, of keeping the cost down and, and the gains uh, up. Uh, so the first study where, where we looked at the, what we call the selection signature was done by my uh, lab uh, technician and research associate um, Chris Granger, who's been with 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 my lab for many years now, uh, he he did this as part of his master's degree, and he was interested in uh, studying a deep pedigree of, of a of a highly successful soybean cultivar from our program that was developed by my pre predecessor uh, named OIC Bayfield after Bayfield, Ontario. Uh, so so what is first of all what is a selection signature? A uh, selection signature can happen from selecting always uh, 
for you know knowingly or unknowingly the same genomic region on on a on a piece of on a chromosome uh, if um, if the detrimental alleles are are just selected against that may lead in uh, to uh, the uh, fixation of alleles in a certain region that just happen to carry the best beneficial alleles and and no no longer can you see any other alleles at that uh, uh, genetic locus so so that reduction of diversity uh, has happened as a result of domestication of plants uh, one example is the tb1 uh, tiosinte branch one alle uh, gene in maize, uh, so the maize progenitor was Teosinte, uh, growing in Mexico as as a, as a bushy plant with only one row of kernels. When that uh, the uh, the mutation occurred and the kernels. Uh, instead of one row got together into a cob, that, that led to the domestication of maize from Teosinte as we know it. And this one mutation had a huge impact. It wasn't the only important one, but it had a huge impact. So, so if it's a domestication gene, uh, the um, going from wild to the land races, you, you, if this is a domestication gene, that would be the red one, and all the land races would have it, would have the allele that's that's led to the domestication. If it's a, a neutral gene, you could still maintain a certain level of uh, uh, diversity uh, through uh, through selection and but if it's an improvement gene let's say for high yield the more we select for high yield the, the fewer the alleles will be left to be selected uh, against or uh, among so so the question was um, what what genes or qtl regions are breeders selecting for during cultivar development um, improvement so, so again, mentioning uh, OEC Bayfield, um, which was uh, released as a cultivar in 1994 by my predecessor, Dr. Wally Biersdorf, uh, who who was also my PhD advisor here. Um, that variety was grown uh, in, by Ontario farmers for more than 25 years. If I tell you that the average life of a, a soybean cultivar is uh, between two and three years, that tells you how how good this cultivar was to be grown for for that long, and why was it grown for that long? Well, because it was not only high yielding, or a racehorse, but it was also a stable variety uh, that responded well to a variety of environmental conditions over the years. Uh, so that it was both a racehorse horse and a workhorse in one. Uh, that that happens very rarely. Uh, we wish all of our cultivars were like that, but not not all of them are. So in the official Ontario Public Variety Trials, uh, this this cultivar out yielded uh, the Czech cultivars by 15%, which is unusual. Uh, at the peak of its growth, uh, it was grown at 400,000 acres in 1997, which was 20% of the total Ontario uh, soybean crop. And it contributed to uh, the Ontario economy by $750 million alone as, as a single cultivar. So, so uh, that, that tells you the reason why we were particularly interested in what's so magical about this cultivar genetically that uh, that has led to, to such a... Um, such impact and 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 profit and, and and you name it. So this cultivar has also been used in many crosses by different breeding programs as a very good parent with good combining ability. And uh, some of its uh, progeny included OAC Kent, OAC Champion, OAC Wallace, uh, and and other public and private cultivars that inherited those good traits and good genes from OAC Bayfield. So, so what we decided to do is uh, to use molecular markers to tr uh, trace, um, uh, to track, uh, trace chromosome transmission throughout the pedigree of OEC Bayfield, both before the Bayfield development and after the development of Bayfield, and characterize the allelic structure that has been established over long-term art artificial selection. And then we, we also performed a selective sweep analysis to identify the loci which may have uh, experienced uh, selection um, over over the decades of breeding. And so and in those loci or QTL regions, we also looked at the uh, candidate genes that were located in those regions. Uh, so, so this is OEC. This is what what it looks like. If you go back several generations from OEC Bayfield, the earliest uh, or or farthest back are, is the top row. Uh, the progeny of Bayfield is down here at the bottom, and as you can see, the progeny included not only the University of Guelph cultivars but uh, Pioneer Hybrid, which is now Corteva, 
uh, Agriculture and Food Canada reached out, campus varieties like Coop, Federé, uh, and Semans program in, uh, in, in Quebec. So all of those uh, uh, different cultivars used had OEC Bayfield as a parent or grandparent, and they were highly performing uh, still. So what we what we discovered looking at different chromosomes, uh, there's 20 uh, haploid number of chromosomes in 20. These are two examples of selection signatures where there's conserved allelic structure that has led to the, the, the good performance of not only Bayfield, but its progeny. Uh, so so as you can see uh, across different progeny lines, the, all, many regions on chromosome one were, were fix, fixed, uh, which means that there was something unique, specific about those. Uh, the crosses were made with different cultivars that may have had different uh, haplotypes, but the haplotype that ended up being selected unknowingly uh, was the one that, that came through OEC Bayfield parentage. Uh, so chromosome 16 was very uh, was similar in that way um, with, with some variation and recombination in certain uh, pieces of the chromosome. On the other end of the spectrum uh, is uh, chromosome uh, 6, uh, which shows no allelic structure. So that chromosome, for whatever reason, there, there was nothing that was extremely unique about OEC Bayfield that would lead to a selection signature or, or, or selecting specific regions of the chromosomes at the expense of others. Uh, this, this chromosome is more, more diverse for its allelic structure throughout um, its, its, um, its length. So the allelic structure um, was observed across multiple breeding programs. Uh, it was important where the fixation of alleles had happened. Uh, in, in breeding theory, major QTLs uh, were likely uh, fixed first. If they were quite important for the performance of the cultivar, that's why they, they got fixed. And then the, there was a breeding paradox that was created for commercial cultivar development. Can further gains be made by adding new alleles to, to non-fixed regions or replacing the existing alleles in the fixed ones? So, so in other words, if something is, is a fixed region, is it going to be worse if we replace it with another novel allele that might actually be better than than the fixed allele. Um, uh, we don't we didn't know that. So so that that opened up a whole range of new questions, which led to us to to uh, to further expanding this uh, this line of research. And uh, just so 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 then a couple of years later, I hired Dr. Robert Bruce. Uh, PhD student and postdoc, uh, first PhD student in my lab, and then he was postdoc uh, for a couple of years as well. Um, Dr. Schenkel served on his uh, advisory committee and was very helpful in reading uh, his thesis and providing uh, comments, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, so uh, Rob, that's his picture. Uh, he's moved on. He works for a for, uh, um, data company in in toronto with with hu in human genetic genetics actually um and uh, so the, the topic of his thesis was genetic structure and pedigree analysis of two soybean breeding pro public soybean breeding programs at the university of guelph and i'll show you some some pieces of of research of results that that he he generated that rob uh, generated throughout his phd and, and then postdoc later so uh, as you can see here from the pyramid uh, uh, you know, the uh, the um, amount of variation tends to 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 be decreased over uh, uh, gen uh, cycles and and uh, years of selection because we tend to grow um, to to make crosses between elite and elite uh, elite germplasm is often a recycle for crossing introduction of exogenous germplasm may slow down uh, or impede that progress because uh, you you may be crossing with something unadapted and and uh, the progeny may have very good very few good uh, individual uh, plants that that can be selected as as a result of maybe watering down some of those selection signatures uh, so perhaps Parental selections are often made based purely on agronomic performance rather than genetic considerations or composition, and that's that's just a fact that that that, that uh, we have tried to, to change over the past few years uh, by doing genomic selection rather than just looking at the phenotypic traits of the parents. 
So the first uh, research question that uh, we posed was, have breeders' selections over decades of breeding maintained genetic diversity in modern, modern cultivars due to selection of diverse parents uh, um, uh, and introgression of exotic germplasm, or, or has have those selections uh, uh, decreased the genetic diversity in, in, our, in our germplasm? So the objective was to assemble a panel of uh, pedigree related uh, soybean genotypes from two breeding programs, Guelph and, and Richtown, tracing back to the founding germplasm that went back as, as far as 1913 for the well, this cultivar we had in the panel. And then uh, we characterized the, the genetic diversity using GBS derived SNP markers to compare spatial patterns of diversity, as well as changes due to selection between historical and modern germplasm. And then we also uh, characterized in the field uh, phenotypically uh, this entire genomic panel, diversity panel for agronomic and seed traits in multi environment field trials. So, so we call that uh, the University of Guelph Germplasm Panel, UGGP. Uh, it, it, it was composed of Guelph varieties, Richtown varieties, Guelph experimental vari varieties that, you know, lines that were not yet varieties, but about to become varieties, Richtown experimentals, historical, there was 45 individuals uh, that belong to the historical ancestral germplasm. And then th these are just the totals for Guelph overall and uh, and reached down overall for a total of 296. Uh, so uh, experimental genotypes were tested by either breeding program, but not not both. And historical genotypes uh, uh, were not produced by either breeding program. So they they were introduced from the gene banks and 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 then uh, they made it into the pedigree of some of our germplasms. So uh, I don't expect you to be able to read this. Uh, however, there, this is actually a really neat uh, program that uh, Rob uh, came across, which uh, which was able to graphically show the pedigree relationships of, of the whole, the entire panel of, of our cultivars, of, of our, our germ, uh, germplasm. And so the pedigree relationships, this would be the earliest, the founder lines. If you look at the left, that's the 1900s all the way to 2016. Uh, so, so how they were all interconnected is shown in this picture. The green uh, is for Guelph. Anything you see in the green rectangle is a variety developed by Guelph. Uh, anything in the blue was a rich town cultivar, and the gray uh, up here were historical cultivars. Uh, so some some cultivars appeared in in the in the pedigree of many other cultivars, uh, and the OEC Champion was had 18 connections alone, uh, followed by OEC Lakeview and Katrina with 14 and 13 connections. Uh, Respectively, so some th this tells you that some of the parents and, and cultivars uh, have been used uh, multiple times and uh, produced uh, a very successful progeny, which at the same time explains why they have been used uh, repeatedly. So, in terms of the makeup of the of the panel, so the fewest number of of um, panel members were from the uh, early 1900s, and then uh, a few were included. Uh, those ancestral uh, progenitor lines were included from the 1940s, 60s, and in the 1980s, uh, that's when uh, the Guelph program started uh, really uh, ramped up uh, the, pre the breeding and, and cultivar development, and that's when, when you see a, a spike in uh, or increase in numbers of, of uh, cultivars that were developed afterwards. So, so what, how did we look at the genetic diversity? Uh, uh, we chose the, the way of uh, doing genotyping by sequencing um, you, uh, and de developing a, a set of markers, uh, SNP markers that uh, were, um, the genotyping was done at uh, IBIS Institute at U the University of Laval in Quebec. I've been uh, collaborating on a Genome Canada grant with uh, Laval uh, researchers and uh, they, they gave us access to their um, to their facility there. So the imputation and filtration were, were used uh, using the programs that are all listed there in the brackets. And uh, in the end, after all the filtration, we have, uh, le we have been left with uh, about 77,000 SNP markers that remained for the analysis. Uh, Genome-wide association mapping was, uh, sorry, study uh, analysis was, was also done uh, using population structure, farm CPU, and RMF. 
MVP packages in, in soft in our software, and then we also looked at candidate genes within those uh, regions. But uh, that that data I will not be presenting due to time limitations. So starting off with uh, the LD linkage disequilibrium DK. Uh, we have uh, discovered some interesting uh, patterns here. Uh, for example, the uh, the green uh, green one, uh, sorry, the historical one, is uh, is the green one is actually sorry, the green one is, is uh, uh, University of Guelph cultivars. The uh, um, purple one is the University of Guelph experimentals. And then uh, the historical are above here in some kind of a red red color. So they're about the middle. Uh, so what we have noted is that uh, the Guelph uh, cultivars and experimental lines both had a, a faster or a DK or longer, uh, sh shorter DK, LDDK, which means that uh, they contain more genetic diversity. Uh, than uh, the rich down cultivars and rich down experimental lines. Uh, the way we explain that is that the Guelph program represents a wider range of maturity, basically three different maturity groups, which which all had parents from different uh, germplasm sources, whereas Guelph, uh, sorry, the rich down program had uh, less diversity due to working mainly in the maturity group two uh, for for Ontario. Then uh, we also looked at uh, how how much overlap did uh, the Guelph program genotypes and the Richtown program genotypes have with uh, with historical genotypes. Historical genotypes, are, I, I understand it's it's a small, but I will try to help you uh, read these graphs. Historical are these uh, red X X uh, signs or marks. Uh, so you can see the historical here, and they're spread throughout the. Uh, the um, principal coupon analysis graph, a PCA graph, uh, and you can see, and then the Guelph experimentals are are quite widely spread, and they they overlap a lot with with many of the ancestral cultivars. What we see here, the historical are also the axes here in the rich town germplasm, and we see the rich town, uh, the yellow uh, squares and uh, yellow diamonds and the uh, uh, red squares are covering a part of the historical, but some of the historical cultivars have never been sampled uh, and uh, that may explain some of the uh, you know, the reasons for for a, lo a little bit lower di genetic diversity of the rich town germplasm comp as compared to Guelph's. Uh, then we, we expanded this further and looked at um, you know the uh, the gene bank, uh, the gene bank for soybean uh, that's that's held by the USDA uh, ARS um, at Urbana Champaign in Illinois has more than twenty thousand access plant accessions a collection a collection that was collected from around the world. Uh, representing all 13 maturity groups. Of those, we selected uh, 5,000 over close to 6,000 maturity group uh, uh, um, two to double zero um, accessions that uh, re are represented with uh, the um, black dots and the Guelph germplasm uh, was represented in, in green dots. What does uh, this um, graph tell you? It, it tells you that out of the large, uh, vast amount of the genetic diversity that's held in the gene bank at uh, um, at the USDA, we have only used a small small fraction of it for for our breeding. So there's so many of those uh, accessions are uh, are not adapted, and we, we may not want to use them. But there's a lot more diversity uh, out there and in the gene bank that that can be accessed for for uh, further improvement of soybean than uh, we have utilized. And that's that's the reason why the red is not overlapping by a, a, a large section of, of the whole graph. It's only in a, in a small section of it. Then we also uh, carried out the uh, GWAS analysis in the panel and uh, using 77,000 SNPs uh, and farm CPU. And we have discovered uh, numerous uh, uh, marker trait associations for days to maturity. maturity. That's a DTM, oil content, protein content in the seed, seed weight, which is a measure of seed size and yield. So some of these uh, these uh, hits were published before, and others were 
or novel um, for yield or for protein that had never been discovered before. And that that's uh, that's an important important piece of information for soybean breeders in North America to to improve their breeding for for these traits in soybean. Uh, then, as far as uh, we took a little different approach uh, from uh, from the study with Chris Granger um, and and the deep pedigree of OIC Bayfield. In this case, we looked at haplotypes and published a, a different paper on haplotype uh, um, uh, analysis. So, what we have discovered here is that as as far as haplotypes go, uh, if you the way to read these. Uh, panels in the in the graph is DTM stands for days to maturity, how how late the, the cultivar matures. C8 means uh, chromosome 8. In this case, it's chromosome 10. The next case is chromosome 19. So why I, I uh, put these two um, squares in contrast or square and rectangle in contrast is that in, with some uh, days to maturity loci, or, or haplotypes have not changed significantly. They have remained more or less unchanged over uh, almost uh, or about a hundred years of breeding. And it would, in other cases, uh, the, the haplotype C uh, for days to maturity, which is later maturity, has been completely lost by this period of 1985 to 2005. So that's the green one. And it, it never appeared again. So the reason being that it, it was a haplotype that led to later maturity too late for Ontario, and we kind of screened it out, selected it against. And the, uh, the haplotypes that are still prevalent are A and B. Uh, not as much change uh, in, in the haplotypes in, for dates to maturity on chromosomes 10 and 19 though. Uh, for yield, there's uh, multiple uh, yield loci or, or haplotypes here. I will just uh, point out one of them. The yield haplotype on chromosome 3 uh, is, is showing that um, the um, a haplotype for low yield, which was B, that's the olive color one, had disappeared by the period of 2006 and 2016 cultivars. We had a small number of, of, of genotypes with that uh, lower yielding haplotype in the experimental lines, but uh, uh, not, not very large. And, and most of the, the haplotypes are made up of, of beneficial haplotypes A and C, but very little of the B. And finally, uh, protein haplotype. That's an important trait for soybean breeders because we try to develop high protein varieties for food grade market. Uh, you can see here that uh, the uh, lower protein uh, haplotype, which is B, that's the olive color, has, has been decreasing over the years from historical to 1985 to 2016. And experimental ones have very few uh, genotypes with, with the... Uh, uh, undesirable haplotype and many genotypes with the desirable high protein haplotype, which is A. So the B is is much smaller than uh, from the begin the, at the beginning, and the A is is much larger. So this this same paper has allowed us to to postulate the, the, the potential for developing uh, ideal cultivars in the future by looking at the haplotype information that we generated. So in this particular case, this figure, figure is showing the ideal cultivar at the bottom and the uh, and two cultivars that were developed in our program, OEC Petrel and OEC Walton. As you can see, the ideal haplotype at, at the uh, two uh, trade traits to different chromosomes for um, for days to maturity or earliness um, would be A and D. That's the ideal. The, for protein, the ideal haplotype is A, and for oil content, the ideal haplotype is C. So as you can see, uh, to, uh, these two haplotypes have already been fixed in OEC Walton and, and Petrel, one for maturity and one for protein. They already have the ideal haplotype. Uh, they don't, OSC Walton doesn't have the ideal haplotype for the other gene for maturity, and, and we know it because it's a later maturing variety than OSC Petrel. And also, um, OSC Petrel, uh, Petrel, on the other hand, has uh, has an, an undesirable haplotype A, uh, which which brings uh, the oil content lower than it should be. So, so this, this 
kind of exercise can you be applied to any haplotype type on any chromosome and and uh, one can pick the parents based on this to uh, to try and develop the ideal haplotype that's shown here on the bottom uh, in in future varieties so another research question that we have asked uh, here was uh, have breeder selections altered uh, soybean seed uh, traits oil and protein uh, or increased yield over decades of soybean breeding so for that we had to grow these uh, cultivars these genotypes in in field trials these are just uh, some details of of the type of plots that we grew 1.6 meters uh, wide, four row plots, five meters long, uh, 45 centimeters between uh, the plots. And so so I won't get into the details of the um, field uh, setup, but that's that's how it was done. And then we used the radio smoothing um, in SAS to, to analyze the data. The phenotyping was done by collecting agronomic traits, yield, plant height, flower color, pubescence, maturity, uh, seed traits, oil protein, seed 100 seed weight, uh, and specialty traits, fatty acid profile, and sugar sugar profile. So this just illustrates the the amount uh, of of diversity we had in the panel from interspecific crosses between the pro progenitor uh, glycine sojourn and glycine max. You can see it growing as a carpet. It's more like a weedy plant, uh, very difficult to to harvest to grow, uh, but some important traits coming from. Uh, a wild progenitor. Hawkeye is, is a later variety from the US that uh, had a hard time maturing and the OIC Bayfield that I mentioned multiple times is shown here looking uh, very good and this is uh, the last bottom picture is, is showing you the, the, the diversity in maturity date. The uh, heritability was also estimated for all the traits under observation and it went from uh, very high for 100 seed weight or seed size to a bit uh, much lower for palmitic acid and and also for yield it's it's moderate at 0.58 uh, so it it it, it covered the range uh, pretty high for oil content so so this is this is uh, you know what's what's shown here is uh, the yield is in uh, is expressed in in kilograms per hectare on the y axis and the year of cultivar release is on the x axis all the historical cultivars are shown in, in uh, um, blue uh, squares and the Guelph uh, program sh cultivars uh, and um, are shown in uh, in green uh, uh, triangles and the rich town is shown in, in red dots and, and red um, uh, 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 regression line. So, so you can see that uh, from the time we, we started uh, intensively to, to breed soybeans, there has been an increase in yield on average for Guelph about 17 kilograms per hectare per year and for Richtown about uh, 15, 16 kilograms per hectare per year has been uh, the uh, yield increase as a result of breeding. For oil and protein, uh, the trends were for oil uh, with the increasing yield. We have been increasing the oil content as well, not necessarily deliberately, but that uh, some of the oil content QTLs are, are closely linked to high yield QTLs, so that that can explain. Protein, there there was no trend whatsoever for protein uh, over the the decades of breeding. So in conclusion, wrapping up, uh, uh, germplasm panel, uh, University of Guelph germplasm panel represented two public soybean programs across decades of soybean breeding and it was assembled for the genetic and phenotypic study of of, of this panel. Uh, Genome-wide uh, SNP markers were developed to study the genetic structure of, of the soybean germplasm through development and the uh, genetic diversity has been maintained. Uh, you know, we have concluded that we have maintained genetic diversity and even slightly, I, I couldn't show you all the data, but slightly increased it in the experimental lines because of influx of some Chinese cultivars that I've brought uh, into the program and, and made crosses to increase diversity for the Guelph program. The haplotype diversity varied across chromosomes, across uh, phenotypic traits and eras of cultivar development, uh, and they provided opportunities to design crosses to develop ideal haplotypes in the future. Uh, GWAS uh, has, uh, has led to the identification of many market trade associations for traits of interest that are useful for breeders, uh, for market assisted selection, uh, and, and also genomic selection. We have started, uh, we have been doing a, a lot more of that late, lately.
Uh, Multi-environment field trials were successful in assessing the phenotypic diversity that's remaining, uh, uh, that has been maintained uh, in the UGGP and identifying significant trends in both agronomic and, and seed traits. So lastly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chris Granger, my previous uh, grad student and research associate in my lab, Dr. Rob Bruce, uh, student and, and postdoc, Dr. Davut Torkamane, he was a postdoc in my lab who, who helped us out, but he's now associate professor at Laval, and field crews at Richtown and Guelph, uh, na the names are all listed there, Dr. Francois Belzil from Laval, and Dr. Flavio Schenko, who helped with uh, Rob's project, as well as uh, a number of funding sources uh, that contributed to, without wh which uh, this research would not have been possible. And with that, I will I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, I know it's a, it's a lot of information in a, in a organism that you don't necessarily work with, but I hope uh, there was some interest in, in, in some of the data I shared. Um, so I'll pass it back to you, Ivan. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Aishan. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Thanks. And now to the audience, if you have a question or a comment to Dr. Ishvan Haishan, please, uh, you can use the, the tool here, raise your hand, and you can um, use the microphone and open up your webcam, or also use the chat uh, for that. And uh, I guess we will have a few minutes for that. So is that an opportunity for you to interact with the speaker today? Yeah, I see Flavio's hand. So Flavio, please. Yes. <laughs> yes, and uh, thank you so much for the this presentation. It was Very really, well. really nice to see one, one, one shot all this work done. Thank you. In, in so many years, uh, thank it's, you. it's incredible uh, the amount of work. Thank you, uh, so congratulations for that. I know that you thank are you. very successful in what you do, <laughs> but uh, it's good to have an idea in one, one presentation. Sure. I have a very, very simple question for you. Mm -hmm. Curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. um, with plants, normally you, we have this possibility to have a um, gene banks that are easy to maintain. Right. So in, in soybean, for instance, um, they maintain uh, the seeds, right? Mm -hmm. This old uh, cultivars. Yes. So for for how long you have to to plant the seeds? No, to produce new seeds so that the, the seeds are always viable. Right. So how, how I, this how this works, right? Absolutely, that's a great question. It's it, it's something that that is necessary to know. When do we need to renew the seed source before yeah, yes, it, it yeah. loses germination ability? Uh, on average, uh, seeds can be uh, they are usually stored in in. Uh, in a cold storage uh, at the gene banks. We also have cold storage here at, at the Alora research station, and it's it's around three to four degrees Celsius in a low humidity. They can be maintained up to 10 years in those conditions. If you uh, keep them, uh, I visited in, in, in Londrina when I was there, I saw the, the Brazilian uh, gene bank there, and uh, they, they, they store the seeds at minus 20. Uh, so, so that with minus 20, you can store them longer, maybe 15, 20 years. And there is also the, the uh, cryopreservation where you can store them in liquid nitrogen pr pretty much forever, no more than 100 years. That's done very rarely because it's very expensive. So, so what these gene, gene banks do, they keep, uh, keep an inventory and when, when the, the 10th year comes up, they, they pull out seed samples and regrow new plants to collect new seeds and then replenish the, the source. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it, it, you cannot uh, consider them in, in very dry conditions, like, like uh, with uh, they, wheat? they do lose. Unfortunately, you you, huh? you know the dry conditions do help, and low temperature also helps. Uh, but uh, they do lose uh, even in those conditions. Uh, if it's not a very low temperature, they do lose germination ability. Yeah. Uh, as a result, yeah. No, that's that is quite different uh, compared to animals, right? Oh, and, absolutely. And, and it's a source of uh, you really can keep uh, those individuals, right, and, and multiply right. them back. What uh, uh, when you preserve semen, for instance? Yeah. You, no, if you if you are going to produce semen, you have to use that semen. Then you have a fifty percent of genetic coming from the 
the mm -hmm. female, you to produce mm -hmm. the, the offspring. So you, you lose the, the, that individual as right. a germoplasm, right? right? In plants, you can do that. Yeah, it's, it's in plants, amazing. we can replenish the source many times, yeah. <laughs> yes. which is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's, that's the, the, the beauty Thank of you. this kind of study, right? You, yes. can, you can really go back to the original uh, right. individual right. plants, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, very, very yeah. interesting. Thanks. Uh, it's You're very the well. Presentation. Yeah. My pleasure. It's always good to see you. We, we go back a long time. We, we are grad <laughs> students here at the same time. <laughs> exactly. Well, do, yeah. Don't tell our age. <laughs> no, I won't say when that was. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. So if, if there is no other question, I, I, again, I'm going to ask a question that's curiosity, right? Sure. But most of the work uh, I was aware because of uh, participation. Right. But uh, when, when you have a, a plant like soybean that has mm -hmm. One percent of uh, cross pollination, mm -hmm. right? So, how you prevent that when you have a field work, the mm -hmm. cross pollination with the uh, uh, GMO, GMO uh, plants? Right. Like Excellent. because the soybean being produced around in Ontario that are Absolutely. GMO, right? How you make sure that there is no cross pollination to contaminate your varieties that are just for? It's it's an extreme. It's a very good question. Extremely important point. Uh, so so the cross pollination occurs at, at on a, on average at one percent, but it also is distance related. So uh, if you have two soybean plants at ten meters, thirty feet, or ten about ten meters apart, there is no cross pollination. So at, at one time in the past, I uh, my in my program, I was developing both the GM soybeans and conventional soybeans, and I, it was uh, always it was a difficult task to keep them separate. But we we had to keep them physically separated in the field, because uh, you know soybean pollen luckily uh, or fortunately doesn't travel very far, uh, and uh, soybean is is a cleistogamic uh, flower, which means it it's pollinates before it even opens. So that's why the, the, there's so, such a small amount of uh, self uh, cross pollination. So, so so the way to manage it or to control this uh, uh, cross contamination between GM and non GM is to grow them at, at a distance of 10 meters or more. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, so insects don't play a role. No, in because case, insects, no? Uh, first of all, so yeah, great question. So, so it means flowers are, are, are pretty. They are, most cultivars are either purple flowered or white flower, but they are not very attractive to, to insects. So it's you won't see too many bees or anything on, in soybean fields. It's not like sunflower or, or mm -hmm. any other crop. So insects don't play a role. And, and by the time the insect comes to the flower and could pick up uh, pollen from from the flower with on its legs or whatever that flower when it's open it was already fertilized so oh, yeah. so which is why we when we are crossing we actually have to go into the bud unopened bud emasculate remove the anthers and then bring pollen mm -hmm. if we waited until the flower opened it would be too late mm -hmm. well, right yeah thanks Susan. <laughs> you're very welcome <laughs> my pleasure All right. Well, I don't see uh, another hands up here, and I think our time is up. So once again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and sharing a bit of your work with us today. And for you all in the audience, uh, we will have our last Sigil seminar next week. So I hope to see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivan, and, and uh, greetings to everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you again. Bye. Bye, Ivan. Thank you. Have a nice You're weekend. Welcome. Thank you. Bye. You too.